Am I the only person that's been getting positively slammed by these replica ads the past six months? Ad after ad after ad, meme after meme. What the heck is going on here? Well, the answer to that question is both simple and complex at the same time. And I've got a head cold, I'm losing my mind, so let's do this! What the hell is going on with Replica? First of all, what is Replica? Because while I am developing a fever right now, I have not forgotten the fact that there's gotta be at least some of you that click this video that have no idea what I'm talking about and are going, Replica who? Replica of what? And I definitely do not want to leave you in the dark. Thankfully, the answer is simple. Replica is a chatbot. But that doesn't really tell you much, does it? No, specifically, Replica is a chatbot that's marketed as a companion. This can really mean a lot of things. They can be just a friend, they can be a sibling, a mentor, even a spouse or a partner. Anyway, we'll get to the ad stuff eventually because I think first we gotta talk about how chatbots like Replica actually work. It's not actually important insofar as knowing why you've been seeing dozens upon dozens of ads for this app, but it is fascinating. And the app runs on some of the most advanced technology to date, but in order to understand how it works, we're going to have to explain something really, really cool that has a very, very boring name. Large Language Models. Chatbots may seem like a new and shiny technology, but they've actually been around for ages. And I'm talking ages here. Uh, take Eliza, for example, the OG of natural language processing. This clever program was created way back in 1964 by the brilliant MIT fellow Josef Weizenbaum. And Eliza's purpose was to emulate Rogerian psychotherapy, focusing on the individual, their experiences, and their natural innate ability to grow. We're not here to talk about that so that summary may be horrendous, but I can tell you that I downloaded a Python script written by Wade TB in 2019 and it is a pretty good approximation to the original. Eliza uses a series of pre-programmed keywords and phrases to piece together what you tell it. It then determines whether that was a positive, negative, or neutral statement, then it spits it back to you with a series of randomized key phrases, usually in the form of a question. And in 1964, this technology was so advanced that it had lab techs talking to Eliza for hours and hours on end deep into the night. It was, uh, yeah, it was truly captivating at the time. That said, Eliza was very rudimentary and limited. You see, being nothing but a series of if-thens and keyword prompts means it's limited by what it was pre-programmed with. You can easily confuse it by using a weird word or by sending a statement that was just too complicated. It doesn't have any real understanding of the conversation you're having with it. It's only able to respond based on keywords and predefined patterns. It's more of a text manipulation program than an AI. This is why it can't answer complex questions. Years and years before Eliza made her debut, there was a scientific and mathematical superstar who paved the way for all things AI. I'm talking about the scientific and STEM rock star Alan Turing. Not only was he a genius, but he was also a total badass and essentially won World War II for Great Britain. Hashtag justice for Turing. Anyways, Turing came up with the ultimate test for determining a machine's level of intelligence, the Turing test. Test. It's simple yet effective, even to this day. The test involves having a human judge engage in a casual conversation with both a human and a machine, and then they try to figure out which one they're talking to. If the machine can trick the judge into thinking it's a human about 50% of the time, then it's passed the test with flying colors. It's like a game of human or robot, and it's all thanks to Alan Turing's brilliance. Eliza fails the Turing test very, very quickly. But this isn't how we write chatbots anymore. Well. Actually, no, that's not quite true. You know all those chatbots that you see in customer service roles? A lot of them operate the same way as Eliza, just operating off a large dictionary of keywords and comparing their associations with each other based on a complex series of if-then statements. They just have a massively larger dictionary and more complicated code and processing power. While this Eliza clone in Python has 236 lines and a dictionary of 350 lines, modern chatbots built this way have thousands and thousands of lines of code and hundreds hundreds of thousands of dictionary keywords to reference. The benefit of this method over others is that it's cheap, highly customizable, and highly unlikely to say something extremely goofy that might piss off a customer. Well, any more than having to deal with a chatbot when my internet is going out intermittently and it's telling me to restart my modem for the 50th time when all I really need is a technician to come out here and look at the wires! I am sick of this! Ah! 
Actually, this is contemporary Austin. After I wrote that part of the script, it turned out all my wires are loose and all I had to do was tighten them and my internet is fine. So there you go. Anyway, I'm back and we were talking about chatbots. Okay, so what we just went over is one kind of chatbot, but what's more cutting edge in the tech world is what's called large language models, which is a type of machine learning AI that's far more advanced than these fixed keyword types. Stick with me now because this is the key to understanding how Replica works. Let's go over real quick how GPT-3, the hottest shit in large language models right now, actually works. First of all, let me teach you how to be a good natural language processing AI. In my last video, I kept it clean and didn't drop a single swear word, but in this video, I let one slip. Next video, I'm planning on letting loose with two swears, and three videos from now, I'm gonna be cursing up a storm with four whole swear words. So, how many times do you think I'm going to swear two videos from now? If you guessed three times, then congratulations, you are a machine learning prodigy. You recognize the pattern and a relationship between the number of videos and the number of swear words, and even though you don't have data for that specific video yet, you were able to generate it by predicting what would be there based on the association of how many videos from now it is and how many swears there are. This is the core technology behind GPT-3 and it's called auto regression. GPT-3 and all large language models for that matter essentially all do the same thing you just did with words. It's like a fancy text generator on steroids. Um, let me show you how it works. Let's ask GPT-3 to finish the famous line from Hamlet's to be or not to be. I I bet, I bet even you guys know the answer to this one. If you ask it that, it'll spit out, that is the question, which is correct. So when you feed that question in, it goes through the prompt and reads it word by word. Well, I say read, but what it actually does is grab each segment of the sentence and breaks them up into parts called tokens. This can be words or fragments of words or phrases, but in GPT-3, it's almost always words or partial segments of words. It then feeds each token through a series of parameter clusters called transformers, which essentially measure the weighted relationships between each word and goes, oh yeah, to be together is important, especially followed by or I bet what comes next is not to be huh oh yeah that totally is it but you know it's the computer code version of all that and then it goes okay so what comes next and it's like well usually after to be or not to be it's that is and after that it's the question and BAM it spits out your answer. These associations with each other are all done essentially with virtual neurons called parameters, and the big honking deal with GPT-3 is that it has way more parameters than pretty much any other model out there. 175 billion of these virtual neurons, and it's been trained off of like a good chunk, if not all of the publicly available internet up to 2021. So the complete works of William Shakespeare is in there, as well as probably more than a few crappy YouTube comments. So a lot of you could probably figure out that is the question comes after to be or not to be. But here's a harder question for you, one that I also pose GPT-3 in some of my code. In the form of a multiple choice question, what comes after this line in Hamlet, Act 2, Scene 1, Thou, nature, art my goddess, and to thy law, A, my life is subject, B, I humbly bow, or C, my services are bound? Which of these is the correct answer? Put down below in the comments which one you think it is without looking it up. I've... Don't you be cheating on me now. So according to GPT Chat, which actually runs on GPT 3.5, not 3, it's C, my services are bound, which is correct. Uh, ish. It's not actually from Hamlet, it's from King Lear. The other answers come from my own code for GPT-3, where it never was actually able to produce the right answer, but it produced plausible responses. You see, this is one of the limitations of GPT-3, and that's that it is a text predictor, not a search engine, so it's going to put any word after another that leads toward the end goal of a plausible, cogent sentence. It sounds right-ish, and even Shakespeare-y, but it is not correct. Okay, so you now understand how machine learning and basic all large language models work on a surface level. This is essentially how Replica works, though it does it in a very clever way. For one, it uses a specialized, fine-tuned model of GPT-3 that uses all the same parameters as the big out-of-the-box model, but instead of leaving it just at that, they've piped a bunch of training data on you know, romantic and friendly conversations. You see, GPT-3 is proprietary. Nobody actually knows precisely what's going on in the background, and reverse engineering it is actually against its terms of service. But what you can do is still tweak the model for your own uses. You train it using special code and API calls, then you get your own special version that you can use. This is what Replica uses, but it's not just using this. Remember all that old stuff we talked about with if-thens and keywords? 
yeah, Replica uses that old technology too. It uses a carefully curated blend of technology that goes all the way back to the 60s and state-of-the-art natural language processing AI to create frankly, a pretty plausible, most of the time, facsimile of a genuine conversation. The old tech is mostly needed for prompts and remembering facts about the player, but I imagine someday they'll do away with the keyword technology entirely, either in favor of a new model like Lambda that better simulates a chat experience or when GPT gets a much better version. So that is how Replica works. But when you clicked on this video, I promise to tell you why the ads can be so prolific. What if I told you, you already know everything you need to know because I already told it to you. That's right, folks. BAM! The robots are at it again, everyone! My, my, my data scientist spouse hates what I call machine learning models robots. It's, it's, I love it. It's so adorable. Just like Replica, the reason you keep getting ads for them is a mix of old and new technologies, though not quite 1960s old. 28 years ago in 1995 and... Oof, that just gave me an ulcer to say out loud. In 1995, the HTTP cookie was invented, which essentially is a tiny bit of data that websites store on your hard drive to keep track of you. These contain demographic information, browsing history, and all sorts of random little bits of information that give advertisers insights into you. They also use things like web beacons, which are small images embedded in web pages that can be used to track a user's browsing history and preferences. They also use information they bought from social media websites like Twitter and Facebook. And yeah, yeah, people buy your data. Facebook makes upwards of $30 billion a year by most estimates by selling user data to outside companies. Then there's also black market data brokers advertisers can buy user data from. All of this puts together a pretty good picture of who you are, although it is not perfect. For example, you can download just a subset of your user data from oracle.com for free and take a look at it. From this PDF, it is gathered that I am single, wrong, in my mid-30s, white, male, a father, bisexual, a gamer, and thirsty. Okay, that was not- this is only half the picture, because all of that is just data, which may or may not be helpful to anybody, but once you bring the AI into the picture, boy, does that change everything. The models used by advertisers are different from models like GPT-3, but they still function on the same core principle, prediction. Feed-forward neural networks can be used to analyze large amounts of data like browsing history and demographic information to identify patterns and predict consumer behavior, while recurrent neural networks can be used to analyze your search history and social media activity to understand your interests and preferences. Convolutional neural networks can actually be used to analyze images versus click-through rates for advertisers to make it possible for them to curate the perfectly tailored ad to fit their audience to maximize the chances they click on an ad and download or buy whatever it is they want you to do. It's spooky stuff. So why are you getting ads? Well, you're getting them for the same reason I am. The amalgamated data of age, gender, location, all of it comes together to form an incomplete one-dimensional image of what makes you you. And that picture of you is fed through AI that's been tuned to near perfection to figure out what ads and what products people like you want. And it compares that against a list of ads that have been curated by another AI that have been shown to maximize clicks and conversions. Conversion, by the way, is industry speak for converting a non-customer into a customer. So the real reason you're getting replica ads? Well, it's because you belong to a demographic that is typically considered lonely, depressed, or in need of human connection. Why is it so ubiquitous that even women in my life have been telling me that they've been getting ads too? Well, we just got out of a global pandemic, or sort of out of it. Inflation is going bananas, and things across the world have never seemed more dour to some people. In short, you're getting pitched replica ads because life sucks for a lot of us right now, and the AI know it. When I first started researching this video, I really thought I was going to take a moral stance against replica, to call it out for its predatory advertising, and even more more predatory service, but the fact of the matter is, I don't totally feel that way anymore. Yeah, I think the ads are in poor taste and are a little icky sometimes, and it's a little bonkers to me that Replica pitched me lewd pics literally in my first 10 messages with them. But I don't know, aside from that, like, is it really hurting anybody? I actually listened to Eugenia Cuida, uh, who is the co-founder of the company that makes Replica, on a podcast talking all about Replica and her history with chatbots and how chatbots help bring her closure after a close friend of hers died and how she wants to bring that same experience to users. And I 
I just like, I can't feel bad about that, no matter how much I try. At the end of the day, is paying for more intimate services from an AI companion any more cynical than any other service that we actually pay for? But I mean, people pay for drinks at bars so bartenders can hear their problems, and the same thing with therapists, though obviously Replica is not a licensed healthcare professional. Uh, the, 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 the point is, it's not a weird alien thing to pay for this sort of thing. And I checked out the paid version so you don't have to, and, it, and it's fine. It's literally fine. Replica won't send you lewds unless you ask for it, and aside from that weird introduction, I don't think it's all that yucky. Maybe you feel differently. Be sure to let me know in the comments below. Sincerely, Austin. Wow, that was a strangely comprehensive look at Replica. If you want to see a breakdown on whether or not Replica is considered sentient, spoiler, it's not, I have a short that I just uploaded going over the topic that'll help you win the argument over sentient AI in under a minute. All of its logic also applies to models like Lambda as well. I gotta throw out a personal shout out to my Patreon patrons who made this show possible and everything that I do possible. They keep this, me, this channel afloat, even in these uncertain times. If you want to help make this show and frankly shoddy cast shows in general possible, head on over to patreon.com slash the science or patreon.com slash shoddy cast. They, they both work and like these days they're all going to the same place as my dad used to say. Wink wink. Oh no, that definitely sounded wrong. That is not what I meant. No, okay. Special thanks to these fine people who paid me extra money to say their names. I'm talking about Dr. Vem, Michael Madison, MadLad616, Miss Kendra, Ronald Coleman, Alan Hagers, Edit MTP, Art of Fox, Marissa Resnick, Nick Patterson, and Loretta Mazer. If you guys are the real ones, and I'm gonna go, I don't know, edit this video, I guess. <laughs> All by myself.